Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Genetics Podcast. This week's episode is a webinar that we ran with Dimitar Tonev, who is a hepatologist and liver disease expert. We talk both about some of the non-invasive biomarkers involved in identifying liver disease in the first place and how it progresses, the role that genetics plays in defining some of the subtypes of genetic disease. And we spend a lot of time talking about some of the challenges of drug development, as well as some of the rays of hope on the horizon with the first approved drug in most of the world for a very common form of liver disease called NASH. So we hope you enjoy and we're going to jump right into the episode with Dimitar. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here today with Dimitar Tonev, who you may recognize from previous webinars that we've hosted. He is a hepatologist and expert in liver disease, having spent more than 25 years working across pharma, R&D, and really diving into what's on the cutting edge of liver disease and liver health more broadly. So we're going to have a little bit of a peek behind the curtain today in what's some of the big news that's happened over the last couple of months or lack of big news maybe, but also some predictions about what's happening in the future and and really what's going on behind the curtain, so to speak. So Dimitar, it's wonderful to have you again. It's been now more than two years since we last caught up on the state of affairs in liver disease and a lot has changed since then. So thank you and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. It's been like yesterday when we once discussed the same topic. And because of the pandemic and in general, the disappointingly slow speed of development in this particular otherwise highly anticipated field, we haven't really seen that much happening, but still quite a lot have happened behind the curtain. And definitely we are anticipating the first drug approval in the forthcoming quarter. So hopefully some good news are brewing. Yeah, agreed. Maybe we can talk a little bit about some of those recent changes. So for those who aren't very familiar, what is the big approval that's on the horizon? And what are the big couple of changes in the last year or so, if you had to put your finger on on the pulse of what's been changing? Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily in order of importance, but the disease that we are so accustomed to called NASH, which stood for non-alcoholic steward to hepatitis, it's now officially the, the bigger group of diseases and subforms of NASH is now called MASOT, which is the metabolically active steatotic liver disease. And there are multiple forms within it to reflect on the different consumption of alcohol, which we now all agree these patients are also consuming. Because we used to define the disease by the absence of what we did believe it's a different liver disease, alcoholic liver disease. So in essence, we used to call these patients what they are not non-alcoholic, which is, of course, linguistically and in terms of stigma, a complete uh, nonsense. So now, uh, whether it's simplified, I don't know, but it sounds better and it's not offensive for patients. And we do agree that a certain amount of alcohol are acceptable given the both uh, noxious uh, elements, food and alcohol are causing similar histological pictures. So in essence, this is an agreement that this is a bigger family of diseases and some of the patients are not consuming alcohol or very little. Some others are consuming a little bit more and this is still the same happy family which is overdue for new treatments. So that's news number one. It has been picked by uh, news uh, outlets. Patients are very happy. We could only hope that the change in the name of PBC, which was, gosh, more than 10 years ago probably, which indirectly led to the development of new agents and relatively active, uh, actually very active clinical field for an orphan disease as PBC, that we will see the same beneficial change here. So on that note, we have seen one very interesting, but unfortunately negative advisory committee FDA level for obericolic acid a couple of months ago, which was very negative for the company that previously crossed this barrier with flying colors when obericolic acid was approved for the treatment of PBC. So now with the same kind of result, but in a negative direction, they were not approved for the treatment of NASH, which led to their withdrawal from the field and the termination of otherwise very interesting, rich data set called uh, Regenerate uh, Trial in NASH. So that's on a negative side. At the same time, data were uh, pu- publicized from the ongoing uh, phase three trial of Madrigal with resmeterom 
which seems uh, very, very promising. And given that contrary to Intercept, they do not have any safety signal so far. The field is anticipating that this agent will probably be approved. We're talking here about provisional license, obviously. We'll probably get the first provisional license in the world outside India because little known fact is that Zydus have already received an approval from the Indian FDA for the treatment of NASH for their saroglitazar. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, it's a small kind of detail. So recapping, PBC, you mentioned, for those who aren't familiar, stands for uh, primary biliary cholangitis. It's a much rarer liver disease and maybe more clearly characterized these days than NASH or MASLD, which encompasses a very broad range of patients and phenotypes, right? Maybe you can talk to some of the challenges of this field in terms of just the sheer heterogeneity of patients that get lumped into this big group. Yeah, yeah. I mean, PBC is a very interesting disease. It's a cholestatic liver disease, which is driven by autoimmunity. It's a part of the bigger family of autoimmune liver diseases together with a brother disease or sister disease called PSC. And it's very interesting because not only in terms of pathophysiology and everything else, but it's one of the very few liver diseases where a drug development pathway was developed and well proven by uh, ongoing very, very good and powerful academic collaborations. Two major consortiums called Global and UK PBC consortiums led to the development of this uh, biomarker, which is approved, uh, agreed by FDA and AMEA called alkaline phosphatase, otherwise a very simple biomarker. This is used almost like a training ground, as a warm-up act by many companies, which, based on their mechanism of action, as long as they are having a pathophysiological rationale to potentially address the cholestasis or liver inflammation and fibrosis in broader sense, these are PPARs, FXRs, LXRs, you name it, they go first to a smaller disease with well-identified pathway where liver biopsy is not required, to prove their world, to get funded, to potentially get a provisional license. So that's the story of nowadays the existing player or what was an existing player, Intercept and Advance in Europe, their partnering company. But similar approach has been used by Genfit. Now, Ibsen, Sima Bay was going the same way. Gilead uh, export all the similar uh, avenues with their Silofex or Novartis before that. So was a very common practice. So small disease, well-established drug development pathway, you try your work and if good and successful and well-funded, you move to a bigger and quite uh, treacherous field of NASH or what was NASH right. up until a few months ago. And what makes it so treacherous? What are the challenges with clinical trials and drug development more broadly in NASH or, or Mazeld, as it's now called? Yeah, I mean, different uh, individuals, of course, might have different opinions. But first of all, I believe the histological endpoints, that was the only acceptable surrogate for FDA and AMEA for not even final approval, but provisional license of uh, agents in this, is based on a relatively solid science, which was created and mostly validated as a diagnostic tool. So we have a certain, some of them arguable, but certain endpoints, which is a resolution of NASH and improvement of NASH fibrosis with one grade. And that's uh, pretty much the same with small differences between FDA and AMEA. But when the NIHR group in the United States and we have a similar SAF uh, kind of collaboration in Europe develop these tools, Nobody actually tried them for very obvious reason, whether they will be good enough to validate treatment response, whether the necessary changes in the direction of improvement are symmetrical and exactly the same and well to be captured by this histological system. So we know how we are measuring worsening of the disease. But we haven't had the privilege to see whether this will improve in exact same way and in the direction of improvement. And so far, very few positive studies have been reported in this direction. And these were by and large small phase two studies. And it seems that 
with different duration of treatment and different number of patients that are getting between phase two and phase three studies, we have seen quite a lot of encouraging results in phase two, which are not very good in phase three. And sometimes some interesting phenomena that nobody knew existing, quite a famous seesaw effect that has been seen in early uh, scenic rock studies. When patients that are improving in the first year of treatment are worsening in the second year of treatment and vice versa, because that was the only study with three biopsies one year apart. So in general, I believe our histological endpoints are not very good for validating treatment response. And we might be actually throwing with the dirty water some otherwise very decent drug babies. And you could see now one of the revolutionary elements of the recent conferences is digital pathology. When you look at the failure study or what was classified like failure and look through the eyes of these electronic machines, you see some quite impressive improvements which were not captured by the traditional pathologist reading. And there are all sorts of reasons why this is being the case. So this is the reason, number one, for lack, uh, less so a successful drug development, the histological endpoints we are currently using. The second one, it's a disease that it's uh, affecting allegedly millions of people. But at the same time, because of histology and because of certain kind of problems that led to quite impressive in negative sense screen failure rate, these are very slow recruiting studies and because of that very expensive clinical studies. So we are talking about easily 80 to 19% screen failures, which means that you have loads of patients, but you know by definition that you have to evaluate and screen 100 patients to potentially get 10 patients in the study. And that's probably still a very good result. So therefore, it's expensive. It's very time consuming for investigators. It's expensive for biotech companies and pharma partners. And in general, it's not really nice for patients as well, because some of them will be biopsied and will go through screening procedure and they would not be really able to get into the study at all. What else I believe is, is, is happening here in the world of NASH in, in general? I guess as uh, such a big disease, we are now quite well aware that it's probably quite, it consists of different subtypes. And the new classification obviously is intending also to, to shed more lights on these granular subtypes. Why this is a problem for drug development, which probably will be improved slightly with the new nomenclature, but not completely. Manufacturers by definition, investing so much time and money would be very happy to get a broad label for the entire universe called NASH or yeah. from the entire universe called MASLD. And they might not be successful in treating all these different subtypes. But if they focus on a smaller, it's still millions of patients, but a smaller subtype and get a label, for example, only for uh, what we now call met uh, the group of muscle with a bigger consumption of alcohol, that product, for example, might be very, very successfully developed for this particular subtype, but that would not be the whole market. So they are reluctant to go in a smaller population whereby they might be logically, pathophysiologically better target, better able to target the underlying pathophysiology. These are one of the problems that I at least have seen in the last few years, actually more than 10 years in this disease area. That narrowing challenge that you mentioned, and I think the screen failure rate one is, is also a big problem in the genetics world that I spend a lot of time in. If you're directing a trial at a group of patients that have a specific genetic form or genetic factor, I wouldn't go so far as to say a genetic form, but like PNPLA3 is the famous gene in NASH that many drug developers are going after with a genetically defined target, but you're narrowing the population pretty significantly there. Do you see a, a solution to that narrowing problem? Or is it just a, a law of gravity in the field that we need to figure out how to target narrower populations, succeed there, and then expand out? I think this is on the back burner for many of the leading uh, clinicians, so to say, key opinion leaders in this field. Because so it happened that many of the big names are with the very, very well-established and published interest in genetics. So they will be all divided if on the basis of, in my simple mind, there are three main genes that are being accused of either being beneficial or negative in terms of disease progression and in general epidemiology of NASH. 
some anecdotal names were also being used was PASH. We used to call PASH, the PNLP3, positive various subvariant of NASH that was invented by the German uh, NASH uh, study group uh, and specifically by Marcin Krafczyk a good 10 years ago. But we haven't really, as a society, been able to establish that these different gene-encoded subvariants of NASH are having a slightly different disease progression and even more so might be able to be targeted by either gene silencing type of drugs or particular small molecule entities that are better, better targeting these particular subtypes. So when this happens... All of a sudden, all the manufacturers, I guess, will be very interested first to recruit in their studies a different subpopulations of national muscle patients with their encoding genes in order to be able to say, okay, from what we are seeing, PNLP, for example, pre variant is not responding to our treatment, but the other two forms are actually extremely well improving after this two years of, of treatment. So when this granular targeting is proven successful, I guess that would be very much picked up by the drug development community. And you mentioned before that the histological assessments are not sufficient, at least alone, they're not sufficient. And there doesn't seem to be a clear front runner of another biomarker to use. What do you think is the right way to think about accurately measuring I think you put it very well before. We know what disease worsening looks like, but we maybe don't have a good measurement of disease improvement. If you could have that measurement or you could pick what you think that measurement would be or should be, what would you look for? This is a very actively developed field. And there is, of course, a simple biomarkers, a non-proprietary. There are patented biomarkers like Prof. C3 and others from Nordic Bioscience as well as now owned by Siemens otherwise very well known to the field uh, ELF test, as well as MRI technologies, whereby magnetic resonance elastography of resoundant is, is very popular and mostly used in the United States. There are other technologies also looking at liver inflammation and fibrosis, like corrected T1 of Perspectum uh, here in the UK. And even more impressive combination markers, whereby biochemical ones, are combined with MRI. And there is MAST, there is uh, MAFI, MOF, and others that I don't really remember all of them, which are having a very, a very good uh, results in terms of their ability to predict histological kind of correlation. The elephant in the room is that you're always comparing them with histological reading. And we now know that histological assessment of this disease is not spectacularly exact. And the inter-reader variability is still a major issue. And one of the companies, probably one of the front runners in the digital pathology HISTO index, published, I think, last year, the agreement of nine leading liver pathologists in terms of their ability to agree on one of the characteristic features of NASH, that it was still called NASH at the time, namely ballooning. And that became such a sensational study because they were able to agree, all of them, all nine readers were able to agree on only one balloon cell between themselves. And they have seen, I believe, thousands of patients. So that was indicating that probably this is not very exact. And therefore, if we are assuming that 0.8 ORC for MRI technologies and a little bit better for a combination test is very good, it seems that it will never be perfect unless we find a way not to compare with histological assessment. Probably we will stay in the limits of this uh, 0.8. And I don't know when FDA says we need more data and we need to be convinced that, for example, <laughs> any of those must score, let's pick one just for argument's sake, that it's good enough to be a primary endpoint in clinical trials in NASH, now muscle. I don't know how exactly they believe this convincing data will materialize because it is not entirely clear what the technology will be for such a study to take place. And FDA is in general uh, quite willing to listen, also they declare during their webinars. 
And there was, during the previous management of the division that was at the time not even hepatology, but gastroenterology, there was a clear intent for them to look at the source data, the raw data from clinical trials, including negative clinical trials. And such data were provided to them, namely Gilead declared and indeed gave them multiple data sets from the negative clinical trials of Sentuzumab and so on, sort of. It ended up that FDA was uh, having some shortages and were unable, I believe, to this day to look at this data. So five years later, we are not any wiser in terms of what these data are able to, to teach us, but at least the very idea that we have to work collaboratively and potentially try to learn from clinical studies reviewed and evaluated by very independent analysts and statisticians, this idea is very much alive and kicking. Yeah, that's a good segue actually to one of the points that we wanted to cover, which I think there's been a relatively new initiative from the Liver Forum asking pharma more broadly. You mentioned Gilead has done this in the past, given data from negative studies over to the FDA. But I think it's a really smart initiative from the Liver Forum that you brought up to gather data from pharma sponsors across the board to pool together to create a synthetic control arm effectively. So this would be pooling data from patients that don't get the experimental treatment, but get the standard of care or other control arm, basically to give the field a a full, more complete data set of what happens in the absence of any novel treatment. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Has this been done in any other diseases or fields successfully that you know of? And maybe you can explain it a little better than I did in my short form summary. Yeah, it sounds like a crazy idea, logical, but so innovative that almost like you are thinking, oh, it's too good to be true. But effectively, there is a precedent in liver disease whereby with the invention of direct acting antivirals in hepatitis C, it was Gilead's idea to run uh, one of the first actually trials with their oral combinations, which was not even based on sufosfovir, what was then called 7977, Because it's an ethical day claim, and FDA confirmed that in a very solid fashion, an ethical to expose placebo patients on interferon and ribavirin, because that was the standard of care at the time, they suggested and started using historical control arm, which was a statistical technology whereby you look at similar trials and you're able to say, okay, placebo response in those trials was so-and-so placebo being patients still receiving interference. So therefore, you are running effectively your registration or study as an open label study, giving oral antivirals combination to patients. And you're saying, okay, we knew interference is able to achieve, let's say, 50% in genotype one. So this is our comparison. And then, of course, they beat this comparator hands down. So that's the precedent that I'm aware. And that was definitely blessed by FDA and lately uh, AMEA in in Europe. The idea was also brought to the attention of not only the liver community, but like regulators, when the post-approval commitment studies in PBC are starting to be discussed, and when the intercept cobalt clinical trials were initiated. So if you remember the story of Bericolic acid got a provisional license based on the data in POI study, but they were supposed to prove their effect on long-term outcomes, the compensation and liver events in a long-term confirmatory trial called cobalt. So Intercept suggested at the time to use a synthetic control arm instead of placebo-treated patients in this study. That idea was at the time rejected by regulators, but still considerable work was done in this field by a a well-known statistician in this uh, field called Bettina Hansen. So now, based on her technology and her collaboration with Global and UK PBC consortiums, we are almost ready to implement the old idea from five years ago for the new assets that potentially will come into the PBC field. So the exact same thing an exact same very well-known lady, Bettina, will be done in conjunction with Liver Forum that it's led by Veronica Miller and actually represents FDA wisdom, academic thinkers, and pharma players all collaborating in different liver diseases. In this case, we are talking about NASH, obviously, or muscle. 
So same idea, can we get placebo data from all the clinical studies that are running in the field and are already completed and in an evaluable form that kind of takes away the sensitivity of pharmaceutical companies related to their assets because placebo patients obviously were not treated with these active compounds and bundle together this data and be able to say, okay, placebo response in this synthetic group is so and so there is no need for you to run a placebo group which will decrease the price tremendously will take care of patients ethical concerns which are otherwise quite sensible especially when it comes to running a placebo control trial at the time when the asset is already on the market so effectively you're asking patients not to be treated for a few years up until few hundreds of them either die or are transplanted, which is a very serious ask. Not that many of them will agree. And that's at least the lesson we have received from PBC. So a great idea, not entirely unheard of. I think it's progressing relatively well and FDA is definitely listening. I wouldn't say this is approved as a drug development pathway because no company to my knowledge have agreed such pathway with FDA so far. But I think that the current acting lead of the FDA committee in hepatology is a part of this group. So that's a serious reason to believe this might come together. Yeah, this whole concept seems to be picking up a lot of steam in the industry. In our podcast, the Genetics Podcast, we had a recent episode, number 105, for anyone who listens to those, that went into the story of a rare disease focused company called Riata Pharmaceuticals that they were recently acquired by Biogen actually. So now they're part of Biogen, but they had a very successful collaboration with a patient organization that ran a very long natural history study. And for this reason, they had very good synthetic control data. So they were able to negotiate with the FDA to to either eliminate or, or at least greatly reduce the size of the placebo controlled population in their rare disease study. And, and they then ran those into the drug arm anyways. So anyone who was on placebo was only on for a relatively short period of time. But I think this is an interesting trend for us to keep an eye on because it makes a ton of sense, right? Why would a patient want to take a placebo? Certainly if there are other options available in rare disease, often there's no other options available, but it creates an ethical, an obvious ethical challenge, right? Of of if you have a drug that we think works and we're putting it to the test and we have great synthetic control data, why would we ask people to be on a placebo for years and risk their life? Exactly, exactly. And if you need a more recent example, it's it's a public knowledge that all the registrational studies with uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, placebo control arm was annihilated after three months. Right. So if this is uh, permissible and uh, a good science in this field, surely we could do something similar everywhere else. Yeah, I agree. You briefly mentioned the recent FDA webinar. Just to close out on that, it was last week. They had a webinar focused on non-invasive biomarkers and other technologies in NASH. I think it was a two-day affair. Was there anything interesting or surprising that came out of that? Or what was the general direction of people that you saw? It was, in general, a repetitive analysis of data that exists for quite some time. And nothing really revolutionary was agreed or establish us, let's say, oh, we believe this biomarker is the front runner or nothing like that. But for me, it was, first of all, very encouraging that they're talking about this uh, because obviously they do listen to the field and discussions at Liva Forum and NASHTAC and many other conferences are being really properly evaluated by the agency. The new element that I've heard, uh, that's a little bit surprising. First, because the webinar was centered around non cirrhotic NASH. But what I will be talking as a biomarker is actually designed or mostly used in cirrhotic NASH. And this is the HVPG measurement, the measurement of portal venous pressure that it's very characteristic and important pathophysiological driver in cirrhotic liver disease. So historically, we have seen a major trial that used this type of Two major trials actually use this marker as a primary endpoint, one from Galactin Pharma and one from Gilead, Simtuzumab. And after this trial, negative readouts, probably independently of the outcome, it was FDA position and in their cirrhotic NASH guidance, HVPG measurement was not recommended. The reason being in personal conversation with them that they 
have seen that the potential therapy driven improvement is very similar, if not smaller, than the variability between different readers of edge pressure, pressure, which we do know require a highly specialized unit and a very, very experienced invasive hepatologist to do it, or radiologist. So five years ago or more, uh, the prior kind of webinar, that was a solid no, don't do it. Now I think they came back to the page with the variability between readers still being big issue and no major technical advancement in this same kind of measurement, even if there are some variants now that are supposedly less so invasive because you're losing a syringe which you instill during your endoscopy session, so potentially a slightly less invasive. But this is seems like a biomarker that FDA now will consider for cirrhotic NASH. That was the only new thing that I have seen during these two days of deliberation. Yeah. Final question here, just to close up, and maybe it's a two-part question, actually. The Madrigal data, the Maestro study that you referenced earlier on in the podcast is likely to be the first approved therapy. Part one of the question is, is that a given or is there a risk that it's actually not approved? You mentioned intercept earlier, having met the predefined endpoint, but then was ultimately denied at ADCOM by the FDA. What's different or is there any similar risk here? And then assuming it is approved, what does the future look like? How does that change things in the field going forward? Yeah, yeah, yeah. the major difference between two data sets, that's a very broad brush, of course, is that at least based on my opinion, they have very similar efficacy based on the interim results we have seen twice from Intercept and once for Madrigal. But Intercept have had some safety issues that were picked by FDA not only in this disease, but likewise in PBC with the same acid, even if obericolic acid is used in a twice smaller dose in PBC. So FDA was aware and quite cognizant of these safety issues, and they took uh, probably most of the discussion during ATCOM, and I think are the major reason why uh, this agent was not approved, because they actually hit the FDA established efficacy endpoints twice. During the two interim results, the analysis was repeated with more patients being included following from FDA request. Madrigal seems not to have this type of safety issues. And I wouldn't say it's perfectly safe because no agent is perfectly safe, but it's definitely as safe as expected. No major red flags, no major surprises. And while you could never ever predict FDA decisions, At least for the time being, there is nothing on the horizon that seems like a big issue for this particular compound and this uh, hopefully completely approvable asset. Why this is important for all of us, and there are speculations, of course, from analysts, uh, folks that are way more prepared than me to potentially discuss the impact on the market. Once we are having a successful agent, the whole story, the whole histological assessment, everything that we knew and discussed already in terms of being a major difficulty will all of a sudden become pragmatically achievable, doable. And remember, this is not hepatitis C. The winner would not take everything. This is a chronic disease. Every new company that comes to the field will have plentiful patients. And of course, Patients probably will switch from one agent to another when better and newer standards of cares are evolving through the or coming from the pipeline. So there is no reason for them to be depressed that Madrigal will be successful as long as they have a better asset. It's still worthy of investment in the drug development pathway that all of a sudden finally is proven successful. And I hope this will be the case. I hope so too. It would hopefully crack open the field more and give people the proof of existence that making an improvement is possible and then sets the bar for the next ones to come around. I hope so. And we all need this and uh, investment to flow into this field, better biomarkers, better non-invasive technologies, more players, and hopefully a pragmatic drug development pathway when we would not expose millions of patients to placebo 
because somebody recently actually evaluated the needs for all the currently established or just about to start trials. And this individual, I mean, it's a very well-known hepatologist from Barcelona, said, we don't have that many patients. <laughs> we right. have to change the development pathway. <laughs> Yeah, not enough people on on earth to meet some of these requirements, especially with 80, 90% screen failure rates, right? Exactly, exactly. Right. Well, Dimitar, thank you. This was enlightening as always. If people want to follow you, follow your work, is there a website or somewhere else they can find you? I'm on LinkedIn and yeah, I'm available from uh, Sano. If anybody wants to get in touch, I'm always uh, ready and, and willing to help if I could, of course. So yeah, looking forward to further collaboration. Amazing. Well, thank you. And as always, appreciate it. And for everybody who's taken the time to listen to this, we appreciate it. If you have any feedback or have any follow-up questions, then don't hesitate to let us know. 